on World News Tonight. Flooding crisis. Damage worsens as Pakistan ambassador calls for international donors to help with the flood damage. Inspection to begin. UN team gears up for a dangerous mission in the battle zone of the nuclear power plant. Mar-a-Lago bombshell. Justice Department accuses Trump's team of concealing and removing classified documents. And 25 years later, the world remembers the death of the Princess Diana, who still inspires new generations. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News tonight. Now, Pakistan still remains underwater after an unprecedented monsoon season leaves 33 million people affected by the flooding. Pakistan ambassador calls for international donors conference to help with the flood damage. With nearly half a million people displaced and $10 billion in flood damage since mid-June, Pakistan's Prime Minister is asking the international community for serious and sincere support. And the country's ambassador to the EU told that it's likely to get even worse in the coming days. The water that is uh, falling down now in the form of rains is going to hit those areas that are already flooded. The rivers, the dams, the barrages, you know. So we anticipate uh, a lot more trouble ahead and uh, the destruction and disaster that we are seeing may actually be the tip of the iceberg. Crops have been washed away and swathes of infrastructure have been destroyed. Ambassador Khan described how over 5,000 kilometers of road and nearly 250 bridges have been battered. One million houses and 730,000 livestock have also been seriously affected. The European Commission has already allocated 1.8 million euros in immediate humanitarian assistance and intends to step up the support. Indeed, this is an in initial amount, so we are looking at ways of increasing it further as the needs uh, uh, continue to escalate. So at the moment we have a pending um, activation of the civil protection mechanism, again from the uh, Pakistani authorities, um, indeed asking for shelter. In the last three decades, Brussels has financially supported Pakistan as it struggled to develop, in large part due to political turmoil. It ranks in the top ten countries most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. and so. Long-term solidarity is much needed. The crisis is going to get aggravated because, you know, uh, the water is going to impact our ability to sow the winter crops. So considering all this, uh, I think uh, uh, an international uh, donors conference uh, uh, would be uh, a matching or a befitting response uh, uh, to the challenge. The United Nations estimates that nearly 160 million euros in emergency funding will be needed. And in a show of solidarity, UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez will next week visit Pakistan. UN inspectors are finally in Zaporizhia where they will spend several days at the nuclear power plant with hopes to establish a permanent presence there. The plant has become a major flashpoint in the war as Russia and Ukraine accuse each other of more shelling near the site. Good morning. Good morning. UN nuclear inspectors arrived in Ukraine's Zaporizhia on Wednesday. As you know, we have a very, very important uh, task uh, there uh, to perform. They said their mission at the nuclear plant was to prevent an accident and try to stabilize the situation after weeks of shelling nearby. They're likely to spend the night in the city before visiting the plant, which is on territory controlled by Russia, on Thursday. Russian installed officials in the area near the power station suggested the visit might last only one day, but IAEA chief Rafael Grossi says it would last longer. Well, the mission will take a few days. And, and if we are able to establish a permanent presence or a continued presence, uh, better said, uh, then it's going to be prolonged. But this first segment, so to speak, is going to take a few days. Russia captured the plant, Europe's largest, in early March, and a Russian military force has been there ever since. But the facility, which supplied Ukraine with 20% of its electricity needs before the invasion, is still run by Ukrainian workers. For weeks now, Russia and Ukraine have accused each other of endangering the plant's safety with shelling 
and risking a Chernobyl-style radiation disaster. Moscow has said radiation levels at the plant are normal and that it has no intentions of withdrawing its forces for now. Germany, France, Spain and Portugal were amongst those who opposed an outright visa ban for Russian nationals saying that Europe must remain united over Moscow six months after the invasion of Ukraine. EU foreign affairs ministers have agreed to fully suspend a 2007 visa agreement with Russia, making it more difficult for Russians to visit the bloc. It falls short of the outright ban called for by some countries like the Baltics, Poland and Finland, but individual countries can now go further and refuse all visas if they see fit. EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell says Russians can no longer come to Europe for leisure while Ukrainians suffer. We have seen many Russians traveling for leisure and shopping as if no war was raging in Ukraine. Member state considered that uh, we are not business as usual. It cannot be business as usual. An outright ban is not on the table because several member states argued that Russian dissidents or those fleeing persecution should have the ability to seek sanctuary in the EU. However, it's unclear if this visa ban will send a strong message to average Russians about the war waged by their government. Foreign Affairs Minister has also confirmed it won't recognise Russian passports coming from occupied territories in Ukraine and would also review existing Russian visas. Russia halted gas supplies via Europe's key supply route, intensifying an economic battle between Moscow and Brussels and raising the prospects of recession and energy rationing in some of the region's richest countries. But the EU is now trying not to be dependent on Russian fossil fuels as they increase wind energy. The European Union is stepping up initiatives to limit its dependence on Russian gas. Seven Baltic Sea nations have announced their commitment to a sevenfold increase in wind power production to 20 gigawatts by 2030. Enough to supply electricity to 20 million households. Putin's attempt to blackmail us with fossil fuels is failing. We are accelerating the green transition. We are getting rid of the dependency of Russian fossil fuels and we are accelerating the renewable, clean, cheaper and homegrown renewable energy. Brussels is also working to reform the electricity market to stop the cost of natural gas determining electricity prices. Other European nations are also pushing for new energy solutions, including Spain, where Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez wants to create a gas pipeline linking the Iberian Peninsula to Central Europe. An idea which has been received positively by Germany. I want to again underline that I very much support creating such a connection. It's about improving the interconnections of the European gas network today and in the long term. It is also about using hydrogen together. Brussels is calling on member states to cut energy usage by 15 percent, as over the last several months, Russia's state energy giant Gazprom has cut off or reduced its supplies to a dozen EU countries. Most recently France, where an energy sobriety plan is being set up. We must consume less energy at home, in transport, in shops, in businesses. It is a collective commitment to reduce energy consumption that must be made. Energy prices across Europe have soared due to the war in Ukraine, with gas costing almost 12 times more now than the start of 2021. Discussions are ongoing within the EU to find a European approach to energy pricing mechanisms. Taiwan said that it would exercise its right to self-defense and counterattack if China armed forces entered its territory as Beijing increased military activities near the democratically governed island. Taiwan has complained of Chinese drones repeatedly flying close to its small groups of islands near China's coast. Civilian drones flying into Taiwanese airspace, taunting its military and even taking pictures of them. The flight from mainland China to the nearby Kinmen Islands, controlled by the government in Taiwan, is a short one. And in recent weeks, these drone sightings have been a regular occurrence, 
as have been the People's Republic of China's military activities, leading Taiwan to increase its military budget by close to 13 percent next year. We will maintain seamless surveillance of PRC activities and adopt the stance of the closer to the island, the stronger the countermeasures to respond to PRC intrusion and attempt. U.S. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi's visit in early August prompted the reaction. In the following days, China conducted a series of drills, firing missiles into the sea and sending planes and ships across the median line of the Taiwan Strait. But Beijing's muscle flexing hasn't stopped other foreign delegations from Japan, the U.S. and Europe from making the trip, including this Wednesday, with visits from the foreign minister of Guatemala, one of the few remaining countries to have formal diplomatic ties with Taipei, and one by the governor of Arizona, Doug Ducey. China has always been firmly opposed to any official contacts between the U.S. and Taiwan in any form and under any name. We urge the relevant parties in the U.S. to abide by the One China principle. China will take strong measures to resolutely safeguard national sovereignty and territorial integrity. Beijing has not excluded the use of force to bring Taiwan under its control. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. A tight-lipped Department of Justice is speaking loudly through its court filing. And Donald Trump's legal team has responded to the Department of Justice over Trump's request for an independent review of the documents taken from Mar-a-Lago. This FBI photograph of documents found at the Florida home of former President Donald Trump, some clearly marked top secret, was part of a huge filing this week by the U.S. Justice Department that revealed new details about what led to the unprecedented search of Mar-a-Lago. In the 54-page filing, the Justice Department laid out its evidence of potential obstruction of justice, alleging publicly for the first time that Trump aides falsely certified in June that a thorough search had been done and that the former president had returned all the government records he had stored in his home after leaving the White House when he had not. The DOJ also said it had evidence that documents were deliberately hidden from the FBI when it tried to retrieve them during the June visit to Mar-a-Lago, prompting the FBI's search of Trump's Palm Beach estate in early August, after which it carted away 33 additional boxes and other items, some of which were marked as top secret. Trump's defenses for why he retained the materials have shifted, and he has not offered a reason for why he did not give all the records back. The latest revelations raise the stakes for Trump and for federal prosecutors as well. But an indictment of a former president, which has never happened in the country's history, would carry tremendous political risk. The Justice Department's filings come ahead of a Thursday court hearing before a U.S. district judge in West Palm Beach, who is weighing Trump's request to appoint a special master to the case, an independent third party sometimes appointed by a court when sensitive materials covered by attorney-client privilege are involved. But prosecutors argued that Trump's request should be denied and that Trump lacks standing because the documents, quote, do not belong to him. In Mississippi, the emergency that has left the city of Jackson without running water is getting worse. The crisis is forcing families to wait in long lines for bottled water and schools to shift to online learning. In Jackson, Mississippi, bottled water disappearing just as fast as people's patients. I've been in line maybe almost an hour. One case per car for a crisis hitting 180,000 people. No water, no water pressure, no nothing. Today, officials said a new water pump should help. Well, they can be confident that the water that is coming out of their faucet is clean when we um, tell them that it is clean. Uh, obviously, uh, right now it is not. The plan, part of an older Jackson water system that could cost more than a billion dollars to fix. A pricey problem, experts say, is already playing out nationwide as aging pipelines give out. A lot of it was built 
by our grandparents and our parents and our great grandparents. No engineer designed a water system to last that long. You got to face reality. At some point, it's going to have to be replaced. In Rockdale, Texas, unfiltered water looking more like coffee after officials said sediment broke off inside old cast iron pipes. Flint, Michigan and Newark, New Jersey now investing hundreds of millions to replace lead pipes posing poison risks. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration has given the green light to two COVID booster shots that target the dominant Omicron subvariants as the government prepares for a broad fall vaccination campaign. Two updated COVID-19 booster shots that target the dominant BA4 and BA5 Omicron subvariants have been given the green light by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration as the government tries to get ahead of a potential surge in infections this fall. The FDA authorized the shots for everyone ages 12 and older who had two doses of the vaccine and is at least two months out from a previous booster shot, a shorter period than prior recommendations. Earlier this year, the FDA asked vaccine makers to tailor shots to the BA4, BA5 subvariants of the virus responsible for most of the recent surge in cases worldwide. The BA5 subvariant accounts for more than 88% of U.S. infections. Dr. Peter Marks is with the FDA and says getting the updated booster is especially important for people who only got the initial two doses of vaccine. As the government looks to stave off the worst effects of a likely surge when schools reopen and colder weather forces people indoors, the U.S. has secured more than 170 million doses of the new Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech boosters. While the FDA acknowledges that the vaccine makers have not completed testing of the updated BA4, BA5-based boosters in humans, the FDA says they are safe and that it's basing its decision on data from the original shots as well well as from clinical trials conducted on the prior boosters. U.S. officials say a broad fall vaccination campaign could begin within days. It was 25 years ago that the world mourned Princess Diana. Her legacy still lives on in many, inspired to make a difference. Flowers at a Paris tunnel and a London palace for Princess Diana. A quarter of a century after her death, Diana still enthralls and inspires. Images of her compassion seared into our memory. Her meetings with Mother Teresa, holding the hands of AIDS patients. That compassion is part of the legacy that Diana leaves behind. It's inspired 16-year-old Olivia Hancock. She was so important to people in the world. Her legacy still continues as she says, young people have the power to change the world. Olivia was the winner of the Diana Award two years ago, set up by Diana's sons, Prince William and Prince Harry, to recognize young people for their social action and humanitarian work. Olivia's cause? Raising thousands for teenage cancer patients and campaigning to end sexism in girls' soccer. Diana was the world's original influencer, using her image and style to draw the spotlight to causes she cared about. Something we all need to do more of. Listen to each other with patience and compassion. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The UN says China may be guilty of crimes against humanity in its treatment of Uyghur Muslims. Michelle Bachelors, the UN's outgoing human rights chief, made the claim on a long-delayed report. Shares of Snap soared after the maker of Snapchat said it will lay off 20% of the staff and shut down projects as high inflation and deteriorating economy ravaged the advertising industry. Inflation in the Eurozone hit a new record of 9.1% in August as energy food prices continue to drift higher. Energy prices still the primary driving force behind the growth. China's financial hub Shanghai reopened all schools including kindergartens, primary and middle schools after months of closures to curb the spread of COVID-19. New York City, Times Square and a number of other locations in the state of New York are set to become gun-free zones. This comes as the new gun laws in the state take effect over the course of this week.
And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we leave you tonight with how the world mourns and honors, remembers the people's princess, Diana, after 25 years of her death. Stay safe and have a good night.